Well, Denise the clown could be sick enough for a shower here and there, there, but many places, in fact, most places, should stay dry. Top temperature, 15 Celsius. Let's all talk at once. Aye, are you all right? Good, so am I. 0161 228 2255. You got something to say? Fantastic. That's fine. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is you can email to Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk. And, fi well, it's not finally, because you can write snail mail as well, but it's pretty tedious if you do. Uh, the text number is 07786 206951. That's it. That's what we got. And just in case you are of a snail mail kind, it's, um, I don't even know the address. Yeah, it's Alan Bezik, that's me, at BBC Radio Manchester, P.O. Box 951, Manchester M61SD. For dog, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm convinced. No, 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 not fully, no. Convinced enough. Anyway, it'll get it, yeah. It'll get it. We get all sorts sent. I'm not... I was once sent something very horrible in the post, but I'm not going to mention what it was, because even I didn't like it. Anyway, there it is. You can talk about anything. We're not bothered. We're not fussy. We don't have any pride. Um, the matter is up to you, really. Another dog's at the local baby, and this time we know the owner. Yeah, Lawrence Delalio. And th there's a photograph of him in one of the papers, all shoulders and height, like rugby players tend to be these days, wandering along with a huge dog on a lead. And the dog attacked his kid when the kid went to stroke it. Now, they've all sorts of excuses. First of all, Lawrence Delalio, instead of grabbing the dog by the throat and strangling it, and ripping off its head and kicking it down the garden. No, he didn't do that. What he did was he tried to find a dog behavioural expert to take it. Oh, don't look at me like that. I'm not making this up. It's, tr it's in all the papers. It must be true. Now, if you... If your dog savaged your kid... Would, I mean, first of all, he has the decency to say... I feel guilty because I brought the dog into the house. I wonder if he'll ever bring another in. The only way we're going to get people to stop having dogs of, as pets is every so often having a dog take the face off a kid, which is what has happened in Delalio's. I feel sorry for the kid. I don't feel sorry for Delalio. He deserves all he gets for being a prat. But I do feel sorry for the kid that is going to, you know, it's had all that pain, the fear, and, of course... It may well be scarred for life. They, there's a good chance it won't be, but no thanks to its father. And the excuse we ended up with was, well, we've discovered, because he eventually had to have it put down because he couldn't find a behavioralist, and they've discovered that he'd had a tumour pressing on the brain. Nobody knew that, obviously. But they had a tumour pressing on the brain. Well, frankly, for the first time in my life, I'm able to join in with all the namby-pamby animal lover crackpots and say, it wasn't actually the dog's fault. I am prepared on this occasion, rare though it may be, to accept it wasn't the dog's fault. No. Come to think of it, it is rarely the dog's fault. It's always the fault of the cretin that owns it. As I've said, letting your child play with a dog is like... It is the equivalent of letting your child play with a loaded gun. And if you're prepared to do it, then you're a cretin. And if you own a loaded gun, then the chances are you're a cretinous criminal. If you own a loaded dog, you break no laws, so you're just a cretin. With Becky Wants, it's Friday afternoon, every afternoon. Every afternoon. I've spent every single night for the last, well, as long as the sun's been shining, in the beer garden of the local pub. And I never go to the pub. I go to the pub twice a year, but, you know, I can't stay away. Obviously, I'm on the lemonade every evening. You understand that, don't you? More Manchester, more Becky. 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 It's sexy, isn't it, belly dancing? It came across as something very sexy to Simon Cowell. <laughs> he had a very funny reaction. <laughs> Do you like him? Got, he's definitely got uh, something about him. <laughs> oh, he has. We've got more than a little something about it. Becky Wong. Very much looking forward to it, I have to say. This afternoon from two at BBC Radio Manchester. They've all been getting a bit agitated this morning, all the namby-pamby government wallers. 
of Ben and getting a bit, a bit agitated because we don't know, it would appear, we don't know what constitutes a unit of alcohol. Now, I've got to hold my hand up and say, I don't know either. I, I'll, I'll supplement that answer with, and frankly, I don't care. I don't know what a unit of alcohol is. Now, they've come up with a formula for working it out. I'm not going to attempt to tell you the formula because you'll be none the wiser at the end of it because it's gibberish. Arithmetic, arithmetical gibberish. But as I said last week before all this kicked off, it doesn't matter whether you know how much alcohol constitutes a unit because... They've got no idea how many units will do you harm. I said this last week. I expected one of the health botherers to come on and start whining like they do. But they never, so either I'm right or they weren't listening or they don't care. Or they were holding their fire for today's Namby Pamby launch. The government is going to spend... Ten million pounds of your money and my money telling you and me how much we should not drink more than. And the figure they've come up with, the number of units of alcohol that you can drink safely, is frankly a guess. They don't know. They do not know. They do know that if you drink like 50 units of alcohol, it might kill you. Once we've established the arithmetic formula, which then provides us with the, the statistic that says what a unit of alcohol is. But what they don't know is at what level of alcohol, at what number of daily units, or weekly units, it is that will, what you might call, erode your health. Obviously, if you, if you get in your car having drink 15 pints and you drive at 100 mile an hour, there's a reasonable chance that you'll do serious damage to the car, to what or who it hits, and probably, rather fortunately in my view, yourself. The same could probably apply with 50 units. We also know that if you're over the limit, and we again, we have this limit thing, they reckon that over a certain limit, you are less able to control your vehicle safely. And so we introduced a limit, and that's fine. Barbara Castle introduced it, a non-drinking, non-driver. But <laughs> tells you all you need to know about that. So they introduced that, and I'm very much in favour of it. And I, I'd halve the, the quantity you are permitted overnight. I would halve it, and it's easy for me. I don't drink and drive. Full stop. I just don't. But the bit where if you use this many units per day for a few years, it will harm you, that figure is a guess. They don't know. There has been no science done on it. A lot of science in working out how to measure a unit. Interestingly, an invented figure anyway. Loads of science gone into that. Oh, yeah, people have been up all night with calculators. But in the end... They don't know how many units are safe, nor indeed how many are unsafe, how many will cause you damage. They don't know. So when you witness the £10 million worth of advertising, just remember that it's, it's promoting a guess. They have no eye. They know a lot of alcohol will do you harm. It'll knack your liver, it'll do for your kidneys, it'll do the lot of you. They know that. But just remember, they don't actually know how much. And all the papers are having a go at it, because obviously all the journalists are drinkers. <laughs> There's no escaping the facts in this case. Nanny State targets middle classes. You see? Because they, they've had a go at the ones that drink lager, and they've had a go at the ones that drink beer, and they've run out of people to pick on. They're having to start picking on the middle classes now. What's the point of getting in the middle classes if you can't get the government to leave you alone? A bottle of low-alcohol lager with 2% alcohol by volume is 
0.7 units. A bottle of wine at 13.5% by volume is 10 units. It's all down here. How many units? But nowhere does it tell you that if you do not exceed these numbers, you'll be well or not well. A request for beer, for a beer, for example, becomes a pint of three units, while a bottle of white wine is described as a chilled bottle of ten units. I know, I know. The £6 million pound message, oh, it's gone down, see? Even, even, even the cost of the advertising's a guess. It's gone down. The £6 million pound Know Your Limit campaign will be driven home with a series of newspaper and magazine ads. We're not saying don't drink, says Dom Primarillo. Primarolo. Primarolo. I like Rolo. Primarolo. Yeah, insisted last night. I enjoy a glass of wine myself. All three units of it, no doubt. No, it is not saying don't. It's saying here's the information and think about it. That's it. And that's what the government's spending 10 million quid of. Saying here's the information, think about it. Oh, don't look at me like that. That's what they're saying. Here's the information. We're not saying don't drink. The recommended weekly alcohol limit is 14 units for women and 21 for men. Why? Why is it that? Will somebody ask that? Will somebody ask that Primarillo winner? Why is it those numbers? For I tell you, the answer will be, well, we think... And then you say, yes, thank you very much, Minister. Now, why? And eventually she'll have to say, well, frankly... We don't know. William in Bolton. Hiya, William. Hello, Alan. Hello, William. Uh, may I just respond to this, uh, the current debate that you're on? Um, about uh, alcohol. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's basically it's designed to take our minds off other things. It, it's, it's to provoke a debate. Um, if the government really gave a toss about um, the deaths of thousands and thousands of people and the millions of pounds which are spent on um, alcoholic disease, on uh, diseases related to alcohol, they would stop opening, uh, letting off licenses open left, right and centre on our high streets so that um, where people can buy it at um, half or a quarter of the price that they can in a pub. Well, it's an interesting thought, but I, I'm not sure that I agree with the logic. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, alcohol has got cheaper and some supermarkets have been guilty, if that's the word, have been guilty of using it as a loss leader. In other words, mm. getting people into their shops for the alcohol that they're almost giving away so that, so that they can then sell them other things. That's how a loss leader works. Mm. Yeah, that happens. But there's nothing that makes you drink it. I mean, if they, oh, sta no, no, if they no. started giving bottles of wee away... Actually giving them away, I don't think I'd be in the queue. Well, I think there's people gullible enough, Alan, that <laughs> if they said, you will save a hundred pounds by buying this bottle of weed, there are people who are gullible enough. Oh, are they? <laughs> impressed by fashion. Oh, well, I hope they drink it. I wonder how many <laughs> units that is. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway. But it doesn't, it doesn't make you drink it, No, it, it doesn't. No, I So, do. no matter how cheap it is... I'm not trying to find an excuse no. for um, being an alcoholic. Or there are no excuses. Kind of. Listen... There was a fella talking to Heather just now, mm. and OK, he's, he's gone good, as it were, right. but he kept talking about his disease. He hasn't got a disease. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict. He didn't have a disease. What he had was a complete greed, a greed and a lack of control. Yeah, well... He was a weedy little cretin. That he is, another, that is a, uh, another debate, I think. Well, it's another debate, but there's nothing to debate. Alcoholics <laughs> haven't got a disease. No. They're just stupid. I, f I find it... I f well, just to, to try... I've been sidelined here about by my own petard, as it were. Oh, dear. <laughs> I've heard of hoist by. I've never heard of sideline by. <laughs> I shall hand the ball back to you, William. Take your petard to, where you wish it. I meant to talk about uh, fascism and this so-called uh, victory over... Uh, what was it? Victory in Europe or something that we had the other day. Um, it... It brought it to mind, really, because of this fiasco, uh, the battle that took place in uh, in Manchester. Was it last Thursday, the football match? I, I, I know what you mean now, because I referred to the VE Day celebrations that took place in Albert Square. Yeah. Mm. The, the, v, the VE celebrations, um, I believe... Well, am, am I correct in, um, in when I recollect that they were hosted by uh, Jeremy Clarkson? Not the ones in Albert Square. They, no. uh, rather unfortunately, were hosted by me. All oh, right. The ones in Albert Square on the 50th anniversary. I seem of to remember he was connected with something to do on the telly. 
No idea. I was, I was busy in Alpha well, Square. <laughs> I, I think it's quite uh, appropriate, actually. Somebody brought up the question as to whether victory in Europe was actually a celebration of uh, a defeat of fascism or, or uh, <laughs> it was actually celebrating um, the non-defeat of fascism. Uh, mm. with regard to what took place in Europe and is still taking place in some countries. Well, yes, you, you, you could be right. There is a there is fascism of, fascism of various kinds. I, I can't remember who it was now, but one of the one of the great sociologists of our time described uh, the Soviet version of communism as fascism of the left, mm. and it's hard to argue against it. Good on you, William. Yeah, yeah I can go. Uh, go on, you have to be quick because we've got the news. Go on. Uh, yeah, I just thought it rather appropriate that somebody like Jeremy Clarkson, who's shown scant disregard for human life, joking about being able to kill people with his cars and stuff on the roads should uh, be hosting such a programme. All right, well, no. all right, good on you. You must never get carried away with the idea that anything Jeremy Clarkson says he means, he is merely an image. BBC Radio Manchester. Headline News. MPs will vote today on whether to allow scientists to continue research on hybrid embryos, which are a mixture of human and animal tissue. Police are appealing for witnesses after a man was shot in the legs outside a pub in Salford, and it's been revealed that the Manchester Evening News Arena is to screen the Champions League final in Moscow live on Wednesday night. Manchester's weather dry with some sunny spells, highs of 15 Celsius. I'm Faye Rusko. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. If you're travelling on the M60 clockwise, watch out. Traffic's queuing up at the moment because of that earlier broken down transport that was carrying a digger clockwise between Junction 1, the Stockport Pyramid, and 2, the Cheadle Roscoe's roundabout. As I say, it has been recovered. All lanes have been reopened, but congestion still lingering back to Junction 26 at uh, Bradbury. And now to Rochdale. Berry Road still closed off because of a collision between Mellor Street and Sandy Lane, with the diversion taking you off via Roach Valley Way, Manchester Road, and Dane Street. And don't forget the whole of the Metrolink has been suspended because of a power failure in the Timpoli area. Passengers may use the following buses. For the Altrium line use the 263 Arriva bus service. For the Berry line it's the 135 or the 98 first bus service and the Eccles line is the number 33. Now don't forget if you can update me do get in touch hands free on 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. You're never more than 20 minutes away from the latest traffic through the day. Anthony in Glossop says via text, Hi, Alan, I have three kids and a Japanese Akita, which isn't a fourth kid. Apparently it's a dog. I did have two dogs, but I was having fits. And when she was... But it was having fits, perhaps. But uh, it was coming... When she was coming round from a fit, she was de disorientated. Well, I guess that's fair enough. That's standard. And uh, would bite. Yeah, or there was potential for her to bite. I had to put down immediately. I was gutted. But I would have been more upset if she had taken the child's face off. Um, dogs are good for kids if the adult is responsible. It helps them develop feelings, emotions, responsibilities and the like. Anthony, that's what friends are for. The reason people think they need dogs now to help their children develop relationships is because they don't let them play out and they don't let them walk to school with their friends so they have no opportunity to develop friendships. R learning... Learning your emotions from a dog is not the cleverest move of all, although it did give us Rome. Hilda in Middleton. Hi, Hilda. Hello. What um, can we do for it's you? It's about this uh, this dog that uh, knocked me over in a park. Can mm. I say the park name? Yeah, I don't think we'll it be was, worried about um, the park. Yeah. Uh, Queen's Park, Haywood. Right. A lovely sunny afternoon, and uh, I was walking by the lakeside. The owner was sat on a bench with the, the dog's lead by his side and uh, I approached with a little caution but I have had dogs me, of my own and um, I approached with just a little caution but um, the dog uh, jumped up on my right side up my leg sort of thing uh, at which point I don't like that sort of thing I said uh, uh, get it on a lead but I might have spoke a bit loud the dog um, ran away a short distance and the owner still sat on the form and then the dead dog turned and um, ran at me with its force and knocked me over 
and with a result I've got uh, a plaster cast on and uh, severe bruising on my hip, on my left hip and um, I contacted the police, the Triang uh, the hospital said Get, have you reported it to the police? I said I've reported it to the council, the appropriate department and um, so I, I contacted the police, they gave me a crime number, they said someone would come down to see me and later in the day a police officer came on the phone again and he said, um, <clears throat> would you describe the dog as aggressive or playful? Um, so I said playful even though, well, yeah, go you on. know. I, I understand, yeah. Yeah, so I said uh, playful so he said oh I'm afraid that's not uh, a police matter it's, oh, um, my God. it's um, civil yep. but you see I, I, you know I can't do a lot about it really only I've reported it because um, I was so shaken up I uh, mm -hmm. well the owner ran off anyway to try and catch his dog but he it was out of control so I had no no way of getting his uh, his name. I've given no, him he, a description. He, he wouldn't have given you his name, and frankly, no. and I'm uh, on this occasion not having a go at them, there's nothing the police could do. They've given you a crime number for yeah. what it's worth. Yeah. Do you have house insurance, Hilda? Yes, I do. You yeah. do? Yeah. Um, have a look at your policy oh. and see whether there is any protection for you. Oh. Not protection, but it's unlikely, mm. but some mm. policies give you protection against personal injury away from home. Oh. Oh, and yeah. even though, yeah. Yeah. even though yeah. there was, in the eyes of the police, no crime committed, yeah. that's actually wrong. Yeah. You may even be entitled yeah. to compensation from criminal injuries. Yeah, it is. It is very inconvenient. Yeah. Well, indeed. Yeah. But uh, it, it may be mm. for being attacked by a dog mm. is a criminal offence. Yeah. yeah. Now, who committed it? We don't know. No. But the fact that we've not caught the assailant, so it is well worth reporting yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate that the copper came on with the objective of turning it into... Because what happens now yeah. is you've got a crime number. Yeah, yeah. But they, instead of them having an unsolved crime on their books, yeah. they've now written it off saying it wasn't a crime. Oh, right. But, but if, you, if you say, well, hang on, it was. So it's worth talking to the criminal injuries compensation yeah, people. Right. It's worth also having a look at your insurance policy yeah. to see if there's yeah. compensation available there. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a great fan of the compensation culture. No, but I you've know. suffered injury, and frankly, yeah. that somebody, someone somewhere, needs to be made aware of that, rather than a police officer who merely yeah. wants to downgrade the crime. Yeah. So have a word with both of those. It might be worth yeah. hobbling along, if you will, mm. to your nearest Citizens Advice Bureau oh, and, yeah. and discussing it with them. Yeah. And uh, have a look at your insurance policy as well. That's All right. very helpful. It's very a, well, helpful. It's, it's only helpful if you end up with a few bob. Well, it's not, it's not a case of that. I mean, I'm having to use taxes or... Exactly. Uh, You're incurring you know, costs. It's inconvenient. Yeah. And... It's in the balance well, whether I go to my daughter's tomorrow or not, travelling, you know. Well, it might be, it might be that there is compensation yeah. available for okay. you, if only, if only to, to reimburse some of the extravagant costs you're yeah. now yeah. dealing with. OK? OK, thank you very much. Good on much. you, Hilda. The thank best you. of luck with it. Bye. Uh, once again, a dog's at fault. The human-animal embryo debate is daft, says John in Atherton. You're not telling me that they don't already have some secret place where they've got a pig with Homer Simpson's head or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> they may well have indeed. I can think of a few politicians who's got a pig's head on from more than more than one occasion. Alex in Berry. Hi, Alex. Good afternoon, Alan. What have you got? Yeah, I'd like to uh, discuss the government's uh, new alcohol awareness campaign. Yep. Uh, before before I start, I just want to say I'm not here to defend the government's position as such. I'm also not a representative of the uh, health authorities or anything like that. Um, is it fair to say, Alan, that you would perhaps describe yourself as a, as a social libertarian in the sense that you don't believe the government should have any right in telling people how to live their lives generally and they shouldn't interfere? I, I'm not very good at um, accepting definitions of who I am, so I'll pass on that. I don't know what I am, but feel free to make your own judgment. Well, I mean, let's, OK, forget the label, but do you feel that government doesn't really have the right to 
as I said, interfere and meddle and, and you know, to, to be paternalistic and tell people how to live their lives uh, on a social level, whether it be how much alcohol they consume or whether they wish to inject the heroin into their veins and so on. I, I believe in a libertarian society where the government does the minimum amount of interference in a person's life possible. By all means, provide information, but make sure the information is right. OK. I mean, I just take the view, I mean... I'm with you, to be honest, but I sometimes feel that, yes, the government can be accused of being nannying and all the rest of it, but I do feel what they're just trying to do is to, is to raise awareness. I mean, ultimately, if people want to, you know, shovel, um, you know, alcohol down the throats and, and have all the, uh, you know, knock-on effects that that can cause, well, that's up to them, but surely, um, you know, the government takes different stances on, on different issues. I mean, for me, and, and I've been on this uh, show before to talk about the fact that I work with uh, young people who, uh, you know, get involved in crime and so on. Um, you know, there are consequences for society, and you can just, you know, look at any area that if people do drink to excess, then, um, as I said, the, the costs, not just financially to the public purse, but to uh, people like you and I, is quite considerable. So, you know, should the government not be applauded for at least trying to make people aware of the harm that they could cause for themselves? Again, if they wish to do that, well, the, that's up the to problem, them. The problem there, Alex, is this campaign will not achieve that, cannot achieve that, because the, the very basis of the campaign is a fabrication. In which way? In that the figure for a safe quantity of alcohol is an invented figure. They do not have any signs to support it. I accept that. Well, if I said to a driver, you really must not drive quick, would that be much of a campaign? You sh really shouldn't drive quick. If we had signs on the side of the motorway saying, maximum speed, not overly fast, or by a school, maximum speed, really quite slow, they're useless. They have no value. They have no value because they have no meaning. If they had meaning, like if, for example, they said, by a school, do not drive in excess of 20 miles per hour, I have a thing on my car that tells me the speed that the car is moving at. And they've also done some calculation with road tests and dummies and all the rest of it about the potential damage caused at different speeds and so there's some science behind it there's some logic there's some sense there's some quantification but just to say don't drive too quick doesn't help and that's what they're saying here they've made it sound authoritative by inventing the unit but the unit has no meaning yes it is a given amount of alcohol but what they can't do is tell you the number of units that are safe can i just uh, sorry after you Please, I've finished. Yeah, I was, just, I was just to say, I mean, you, I think you mentioned that the um, the guideline, and if it's uh, a guideline, as I think you've pointed out, it was 14 units for women and 21 for men. I think the last time I was talking about this matter, I think it had gone up to 28 units for men and 21 uh, for, for women. But that as an aside, I mean, I, I think the problem with this, with this whole debate is because you know, as human beings, we come in all shapes and sizes. It's not possible, or I don't think with any kind of concrete authority can you say, um, because we're all different and respond differently to alcohol, I don't think they can say with any certainty, you know, how much a particular unit of alcohol will affect us in a physiological way. That, indeed, that's the they, indeed they cannot, but the thing that I object to here isn't and we have the same with the smoking campaign or the anti-smoking campaign where they yeah. say smoking is bad for you smoking can kill you they even put it on adverts and they put it on the cigarettes smoking can kill you from heart disease it can kill you from lung disease it can kill you from all sorts of things uh -huh. so don't smoke what they don't do is say one cigarette constitutes this much alcohol Therefore, you should smoke no, smoke no or, or, or one cigarette contains this quantity of poison, which we'll calculate as four. And you must therefore smoke no more than, than I don't know, six units of poison in a day. They don't do that. They just say, look, smoking will kill you. Don't do it. With alcohol, in order to give credence 
to their invented number, they've actually given some science to the invention of the number. But it doesn't make the message right. The message is based on a guess. And I don't think the government, whether you agree or disagree with the government's responsibility to inform the public, I don't think they should be informing the public that we've had a bit of a guess and we think the guess is this. That's, that's not it. But what's even worse is the duplicitousness where they don't say we've had a bit of a guess, they say here is some numbers. These numbers are valuable and we can show the root of these numbers. What they don't do is say, but in effect the numbers are meaningless. I mean, what I understand, and, and I'm by no means an expert, you know, what any amount of alcohol um, impairs judgment and um, I would go as far to say is harmful, but I would put the, the harmful, uh, harmful impact on a, on a, on a spectrum. You but, know. You see, but, but that's the problem, Alex. The, the, the serious problem here is that there are those that would argue, and I'm talking about medical people and scientists, there are those that would argue actually some alcohol in certain circumstances is beneficial. I remember the debate when things over red wine probably a decade ago. Yep. First of all, it was harmful, then they said two mm -hmm. glasses or whatever a day is actually <laughs> good for yeah. the heart. So, so I, un I understand the argument, and to be honest, I'm not convinced either way. I, te I tend not to, um, you know, take too much credence to it because if you read the front page of certain tabloid newspapers, every day there's a health scare, don't <laughs> eat this, not. So I, I am healthily, I'm healthily sceptical, but... Well, I think it's, well, this is my view. I think any consumption of, of alcohol is not doing you any good. It may not be doing you any harm. It may be negligible, but it, I don't think it necessarily has a, has a positive uh, impact. But I think the more you drink, but, but Alex, you I can, think the more... You can mount the same campaign about ice cream. <laughs> or Mars bars. If you eat I'm sure 50, you could. I'm sure you could. And that's the problem. Having a Mars bar will do you no harm at all. But let's Having an ice cream will do you no harm at all. Having a glass of wine will do you no harm at all. Having 50 of either in your buggered. I think, though, <laughs> just, 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 again, to try and join up the dots, though, for the government, and again, I'm not a spokesperson for the government, I think there's, there's a wider issue here, really, which is about, for me anyway, in the, in the job I do, it's about... I think there is a problem with binge drinking, however you defer, define it, or, or people drinking too much and consuming too much. I think there is a problem, and I see that in my job most days and, and, and the consequences of, of men and women drinking too much alcohol, you know, and getting done for drink driving or getting into fights and, and so on. I think there is a problem out there. I don't think it's something to be ignored, but, you know, how you uh, try and mount a defence or, you know, put information out there to kind of discourage people from, from behaving in that way, particularly if you are socially liberal like myself, I just don't know, because I think people ultimately have to be responsible for their own actions. But, you know, to, to, to use a phrase, how do you get people to protect themselves, to, you know, to protect themselves from, from the, the harm that they might cause themselves, you know what I mean? So... Well, one way, and I think it should be the starting point of all governments, but unfortunately it's the starting point of no government, one way is to not lie to the public. I agree with that. And that's what they're doing. And that's what I find wrong. I'm okay. all in favour of the government educating the public. I'm not in favour of the government lying to the public in the pretense that it's educating it. OK, that's, that's a good <laughs> point to leave it anyway. But <laughs> Have a good, good day, day, Alex. 0161 Brian says, Alan, regarding the forthcoming football match in Moscow this Wednesday, on the news this morning it said that no smoking or drinking is permitted in Red Square because that particular location is held in high respect and regard by the Russian authorities. Although I have no particular admiration for the authoritarian regime in Russia, what a pity it is that the centre of Manchester could not be similarly protected and respected. This restriction, which would be impossible for the Manchester authorities to enforce, will, I'm willing to bet, be complied with by fans visiting Moscow. I wonder why. Brian, I too wonder. I'm quite looking forward to all the stories we'll have on Thursday morning of Manchester United fans who've been arrested in Moscow and who, frankly, did absolutely nothing wrong at all, like all the Scousers locked up in Italy and Spain and all the rest of it. They did nothing wrong. The trouble with foreign police when arresting the Brits, they don't realise that Brits abroad are always innocent. 
when it, unless they're drug dealers, obviously, and only then if they've got it stuffed in a johnny and shoved up their bum. BBC Radio Manchester. Headline news. Tampering with nature or saving lives? That's the question facing MPs as they prepare to vote on aspects of the human fertilisation and embryology bill. A survey's found that three quarters of drinkers don't know that a typical glass of wine contains three units of alcohol. And it's been revealed that the Manchester Evening News Arena is to screen the Champions League final in Moscow live on Wednesday night. Manchester's weather dry with some sunny spells, highs of 15 Celsius. I'm Faye Rusco. BBC Radio Manchester, 2020 traffic. Well, thankfully, traffic's eased off on the M60 clockwise now. There was a broken down vehicle stuck between Junction 1 at the Stockport Pyramid and 2 the Cheadle Roscoe's roundabout. That's since been recovered and traffic does seem to be getting back to normal again. In Rochdale, Berry Road still closed because of an accident between Mellor Street and Sandy Lane. Again, the diversion takes you onto Roach Valley Way, Manchester Road and Dane Street. And problems continue at the moment on the Metrolink, I'm afraid, because of a power failure in the Timpley area. The whole of the line's currently suspended. Passing Passengers are being advised to use the following buses. For the Altrium line, use the uh, 263 Arriva bus service. For the Berry line, it's the 135 or the 98 first bus service. And the Eccles line, the 33. Now, don't forget, if you can update me, then do get in touch hands-free. And the number to dial, as always, 0161 244 4951. I'm Carla Banks. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports with Mark Elliott. As Manchester United head to Moscow, much has been made of the nine years that that have passed since their last Champions League final. But for goalkeeper Edwin van der Sar, the wait's been even longer. He played in the 1995 and 96 finals for Ajax, winning one and losing the other. And when he joined Fulham from Juventus, he assumed his chances of another final had gone. When I went time at Fulham, I went a couple of times to watch, uh, to watch Chelsea against, uh, against Barcelona, against Bayern Munich, I think. And I saw Oliver Kahn uh, doing the warm-up and everything. I thought, yeah. What must I do to, 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 to get there again? And, you know, with Fulham, it was, was, <laughs> was going to be difficult to, uh, to do that. Meanwhile, the Chelsea goalkeeper, Petr Cech, has suggested that United may not be as hungry for success as Chelsea when they meet on Wednesday night in Moscow. Cech has told the Inside Sport programme that United's Premier League triumph may work in Chelsea's favour. Well, having won the title... You, you would say it's a big boost for them, you know, because mentally they know they, they won the title, they finished above us and they celebrated, which in, in one way can be destructive. You know, when you, when you know you already want something, even if you don't want, you can relax. In, in, in the back of your mind, you have already that you succeeded and in the season, you know, we succeeded and, and maybe they will be more relaxed and, and this could be the advantage for us. UEFA have confirmed that Slovakian referee Lubos Michel will take charge of that Champions League final. He was the referee who awarded a highly controversial goal to Liverpool against Chelsea in the semi-finals of the competition in 2005. Chelsea have always argued that the shot from Luis Garcia didn't cross the line. And when you're making your plans for Wednesday night, remember that we have a very special Manchester Sports from 6 o'clock with all the build-up, full match commentary and analysis from the Lizhniki Stadium, plus all the reaction after the game. Elsewhere, the Real Madrid coach Bernd Schuster has played down talk of Cristiano Ronaldo joining the club. Last week, Real's director-general claimed they had the financial resources to buy the Manchester United winger, even for £100 million. But Schuster admits he doesn't think it's possible to sign him this summer. Michael Carrick says wearing Roy Keane's number 16 shirt for United hasn't put any extra pressure on him. Speaking ahead of Wednesday's Champions League final, the midfielder described Keane as a legend, but said wearing his shirt didn't really affect him. And of course, it isn't just the Champions League final we have to look forward to. The Rochdale boss Keith Hill has urged his side to make their own history as they face Stockport in the League Two playoff final at Wembley next Monday. Dale have been in the bottom tier of English football for the last 34 years, but are now just 90 minutes away from promotion to League One. I'm sick of hearing about the history of the football club, what we haven't done. That's what we always talk about, making history. That's what we're here to do now. We're here in this moment. We're trying to create history for other people to talk about. But this club shouldn't be seen as a small club. Like We're nurturing a very good young squad here, and we want to be successful. That's how ambitious the players are, the coaching staff, the football clubs turn the corner. You know, they want to be ambitious. They want to get into League One, and that's our aim now. 
From the Stockport side of things, it was a Liam Dickinson goal that gave County a 1-0 win over Wickham at Edgeley Park, 2-1 on aggregate. But manager Jim Gannon says his side still has one more goal left to fulfil. It's a fantastic achievement to be in the playoffs. It's a fantastic achievement to win the semi-finals and be at Wembley. But ultimately, everybody's striving for the third achievement, which is to win at Wembley and be promoted. Everybody involved with the club are probably dreaming uh, of next Monday and uh, it's the third part of what we want to achieve. And you can hear that playoff final live from Wembley next Monday in Manchester Sports starting at 2 o'clock. And some other football news just in. The entire staff of Gretna Football Club have been made redundant. That announcement's been made by the director of football at Gretna, Mick, Mick Wadsworth. The entire staff of Gretna Football Club made redundant. On to cricket now, and the first test at Lords between England and New Zealand continues to head towards a draw. Lancashire's James Anderson and Ryan Sidebottom took a wicket each early on this morning to give England a glimmer of hope of victory. And Monty Panassar's just taken his first wicket of the innings, but there's been little else to cheer the England fielders, including a regulation slip catch being put down by Andrew Strauss. The latest score has New Zealand on 101 for three. That's a lead of 59 runs. Rugby Union now, Danny Cipriani's learned he'll be out of action for around six months. Wasps have confirmed he suffered a fractured dislocation of his right ankle in their Premiership playoff semi-final win over Bath. It means the England fly half may also miss the autumn internationals. Athletics is set to be hit by more damaging revelations when a court case opens in San Francisco later today. The former sprinter Trevor Graham is alleged to have supplied drugs to the likes of Marion Jones, Tim Montgomery and Justin Gatlin and stands accused of lying to investigators during the infamous Bulco investigation. And finally for now in tennis, after reaching the third round of the Hamburg Masters last week, Andy Murray continues his rise up the world rankings. He's moved up three places to number 11. So that bloke who made the announcement that the entire staff of Gretna Football Club have been made redundant, presumably he's going too. So he's had to announce his own, <laughs> his own redundancy. I like the sound of that. Follow Manchester United in the Champions League on BBC Radio Manchester. We've had a lot of close calls over the years and you don't forget these things because we should have a better record in Europe. And there's the final whistle. Manchester United are through to their Champions League final, their dearest break. We had a great squad in 99 and that was used during the season. Similar this year, so there are similarities. We've played some great football in the Champions League this year. Fate is fate, and I think we even fate. The Champions League final. The build-up, the action, and the reaction. Wednesday evening from 6. BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Are you all right? Good. Well, so that kicks off at quarter to eight. But it's in Moscow. It'll be a lot. Midnight or something at one. <laughs> Quarter to eleven. Oh, so they'll be playing after midnight. Oh, dear God, that's hard. Michael in Warrington, how are you doing? Not too bad, thank you. What can we do for you? Um, well, I stood for the Appleton Parish Council in the recent local elections. On how'd, the first how'd you do? Well, when I watched the count, I thought I'd been elected. Oh, dear. But then the electoral staff... In contravention of the rules... Hang on, hang on. What do you mean, contravention well, of the rules? Well, the rules say that they must do all the count in front of the candidates. OK? I think the rules say the count... The, <laughs> I think the rules are less specific than that. I think the rules say that the candidates are entitled to watch the count, but it's not compulsory. Right. Well... Because somebody... If, if, they, do, if they said they've got to do the count in front of all the candidates... No, in front of the candidate that's in the particular ward that they are. No, counting. even even there, if they said, if the rules were that they have to do the count in front of all the candidates who are standing in that particular section of the election, if one of the candidates said, "I can't be bothered," what would they do? Well, that's that's his choice. Uh, indeed, but the rule you quoted, you quoted inaccurately, right. which is well, why if I'm pointing the candidate out. Candidate is present then. Well, <laughs> it's not about if he's president. The, no, the, if the he's rule, president, if it's, he's president. it's not about that. It's about whether he has the right to be there. Well, under the rules as agreed with the returning officer, and she has written to me yeah. confirming this, 
I had a right to be there. That and, is correct. And I had a right to watch the count. And were you disbarred in some way? Yes. How were you disbarred? They took the count away from the side table where it was being done in front of me, where the piles of votes had been, shall we say, laid out, and they took it to the centre table to, shall we say, finish it off. Mm -hmm. And while it was at the centre table, I couldn't see what was going on. When the votes were in front of me, mm -hmm. I clearly... Uh, one, one of the four seats that were available in the ward in which I stood. When she announced the result, and she announced the result again in contravention of the rules, and she's confirmed this in writing to me now, that she should have come and consulted any candidate that was there before she announced the results, Suddenly, the man who was well behind me had got an additional 400 votes. If now, you're alleging, and you do sound strongly like you are, if you're alleging that what I'll call jiggery-pokey took place, then this is not the forum on which to do it. No, I've already done it. Right. I've made a formal application to the Royal Courts of Justice in Right, London. so as long as, as long as you know the process. Yes, that's done. Right. Now, frankly, at this stage, it's invidious for me to continue with a conversation that makes such a serious allegation of either... No, I don't want to talk about the allegation. Well, you just did. Right, I want to tell you... You just what, did. I just want to tell you... Oh, well, just stop for a moment. Right. Because I want to just say something that I have to say. Yeah. And that is that if, if you, you have made an allegation on this radio station against an individual or an organisation of either um, incompetence or something much more serious. Yes. Now, that puts me in a very, very difficult position. I, I wasn't aware you were going to do that. Right. Obviously, well, I can't be. It's a phone-in. And what I must now do, what I must now do is give an opportunity to the organisation or individuals who stand thus accused right. to put their side of the story. And you're... because of that, and because of that, I'm not prepared to let you to continue okay. with that element of what you have to say. Right. I'd be delighted. I'm not interested. You're, you're now speaking about it again. No. If All you right, do that again, go, it will end. Let's go to tell you what I've done. Can tell I do me what that? You, you can tell me what you've done right. by all means. I've made an application to the Royal Courts of Justice in London to have the election um, declared null and void. Indeed, yes, that is the normal process. That is now with the Royal Court. I'm aware. And I'm awaiting the outcome of that hearing. Mm -hmm. I have received a letter from the Chief Executive of the Warrington Borough Council. Right, you've just named another individual, and right. like I said, that is how it will end. Um, I'm not prepared to enter in a discussion with you on that basis. That's it. Final. I may be unjust in that, and frankly, if I am, tough. I don't care. But I will now have to approach the relevant authorities to which you alluded and give them, if they choose it, the opportunity to readdress that which... or address that which you've just said. But frankly... I'm not sure that the legislation as you describe it requires that you are able to sit there and watch every single vote be counted. I think you merely have the right to be in the room. And moving the count from one table to another, I would argue, does not alter your... does not impair your right. But there you are. You've made the allegation we will now do what we need to do about it. Michael, thank you very much indeed for your call. Um, there's no reason... I, I'm not having a go at you, Michael. I'm not letting you speak again, but I'm not having a go at you. There is no reason why you should know the rules, but there's every reason why I should. John in Berry. Hi, John. Hello, Alan. What can we do for you? Um, my uh, thing is regarding police marksmen. Over the last uh, few years, we've always heard about police marksmen. They seem to be able to... It's a brick wall from the penalty spot, but they're always killing. They never wound. Mm. And it's my opinion that they should change the uh, guns to something that's going to be more uh, life... Uh, well, keeping life rather than killing it, killing it. And they can also use tear gas 
Why haven't they used tear gas? I'm thinking of this this barrister who was shot in London. And the, uh, the well, the, the, let, me, let me let let me put a question to you. Here we have a man firing a shotgun indiscriminately out of a building. Correct. Yeah. Now. I've spoke to you before because I'm an ex DCI. Okay. Now, what what munition? And I use that word in the broadest sense. What munition is available that would render him unable to do that immediately? Not in a minute's time when it takes... They could wound instead of kill. That might not work. It might work because... They well, don't, it might it's, work, It's indiscriminate shooting, actually, I think. Well... And also, they, might, could fire, but, they could fire a, a John, gas gun. No, well, <laughs> again, a gas gun will not work immediately. I know that, but all right, it doesn't work immediately, but it, it frightens the person who's re on the receiving end. It might frighten him to let off a couple more shots, in fact. Oh, come off it, Alan. What do you mean, come off it? Well, look, if there's somebody going firing a shotgun, they, they're not going to... They're going to fire a, a gun, uh, pellets or whatever they would, a uh, uh, gas gun or... or um, uh, tear gas into that room and then they're just going to hold their fire for a while. Well, that's your theory. It is my theory, yeah. I, I, I disagree with you emphatically, and when I was a squaddy, we were told... Oh, squaddy, you were never a squaddy. You couldn't even press the damn trigger and hit a target. You always shut your eyes when you press the trigger, you did. You must make your judgments wherever you wish, John. But what I was told... Alan, stop being a feather plucker all the time, will you? Uh, John, what I was told was that once you've decided to pull the trigger, you go for a kill shot. No, you didn't. I served in the war, and we never did that. Did you not? No. It's just as well. Because just we as well, told, some we of the other ones did, isn't in it? In Burma, we were told to bring back prisoners, and we brought um, back well, the officers that's and That's a prisoners. slightly different thing. Yes, it, it wasn't. Yes, if you yes, it is. No, if it you, wasn't. We if you're wanting, the, the if you're wanting to keep them alive, yes, and, well, that's and, what we are, did. and are prepared to take the risks of that, which are many, then fine. But when a person is indiscriminately firing. On a British street, we don't want to take that risk. They could have said they could have fired a grenade into his room that was full of gas, and that would and have exploded immediately. It would not have exploded immediately. Of course, it, does. it would a have exploded. It would have exploded within possibly two seconds. Correct. And in one second, he could have killed somebody. Oh, come off it. You're being a feather plucker again. Well, actually, John, I, I'm usually very much against shooting people <laughs> and very much against capital punishment, but I think once a person's let off a shot, he's invited death. No, 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 no. Well, no. we disagree, John. No, no, no. We disagree. We disagree in two, in two respects. One, we disagree with the principle, which I just outlined, but I don't think... I, I know I disagree with you on the potential incapacitation of a wound shot or indeed a gas grenade. There I are disagree different, with you. There's different ammunition available now and the police don't seem to go any further than a, than a, a bullet. That's where they stop. They don't go any further than a bullet. There's different ammunition knocking around now. Well, there is indeed different ammunition. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but good on you, John. It's, uh, it's an interesting conversation when I'm to the right and somebody else is to the left. Yeah, but the <laughs> trouble is, Alan, that you are always to the left. <laughs> well, on this occasion, I appear to be further to the right than you, which, uh, as I say, is a unique experience for me, well, John. Well, I've spoken to... I've actually spoken to uh, some of the armed officers, and they agree that that would be ideal if they could do something like that. Well, so that's, you, that's what, where the taser came in. John, we've got to end it there, more's the pity. can't use a taser John, through a glass window. I'm not suggesting we can, but that's what the taser was meant to do, give them another set of armaments. Yep. But, of course, wait, I've got to end wait. it, John. We've got to end it, not because I'm losing or winning, but because of this. <laughs> This is Comrade Matt Trewern, and I'm Comrade Steve Wyeth as Hauster this week on BBC Radio Manchester to Moscow. Well, what do you think? Simplifying the call, what do you think? Should the police shoot to wound? Or when somebody's letting off rounds into the public, should they shoot to kill? Sounds simple. What do you say? 95.1 FM.
DAB Digital Radio and the World Wide Web. This is Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester. At one o'clock, MPs will vote on whether human-animal embryos should be created for medical research, and the Red Army makes their way to Moscow. The man games are in full swing ahead of the Champions League final. Well, this afternoon is mainly dry with some sunshine and top temperatures of 14 Celsius. And the problems continue this hour on the Metrolink because of a power failure at Timpley. The whole line has been suspended. Passengers may use the following buses. For the Altrincham line, use Arriva Bus Service 263. And for the Berry line, it's the 135 or the 98 first bus. Good afternoon, I'm Faye Rusco. Tampering with nature or saving lives? That's the question facing MPs as they prepare to vote on aspects of the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Bill. Gordon Brown wants scientists to be allowed to create hybrid human and animal embryos for medical research. But the Conservative MP David Burroughs is against the idea. He thinks two other options should be considered first. Adult stem cell research, um, areas such as umbilical cord blood, which at the moment is 90%, 98% is thrown away. If we could could uh, focus more and not get involved in the distraction of uh, human admix embryos because the scientists have said to us well we can't give any clear scientific evidence that there's going to be therapeutic treatments now but let's just have it for hope in the future and I think this is frankly a blind alley. The mass exodus has begun. Thousands of Manchester United fans have set out on their journey to the Champions League final in Moscow. Some are travelling by car, some by train, but the lucky majority have opted for the plane. More than 25,000 fans will leave Manchester Airport over the next 48 hours. Russell Craig is a spokesperson there. It's going to be a really, really big week this week. We've got, in total, 88 additional flights. And if you think about what the time of year is, we're already starting to gear up to the summer season. So a busy busy week and the biggest day is actually going to be wednesday when we've got 33 flights leaving within about five hours early in the morning yes a very busy week for manchester airport this week millions of people across china have observed a three-minute silence to mourn the victims of a Sichuan earthquake the official number of dead now stands at 34,000. a couple from herefordshire barry and christine jackson have returned home after being trapped on a coach when the earthquake struck Mr Jackson, describe what happened. I suppose it's a certain amount of self-preservation, but there's not a lot you can do when you've got the mountains around you appearing to be starting to collapse and uh, we could we could see the, uh, the tops of the mountains sort of coming down. Police want witnesses to a fatal accident on the M60 near Ashton under Line to come forward. A lorry hit a 35-year-old pedestrian on the anti-clockwise carriageway at Junction 21 during Friday evening's rush hour. The motorway was closed for five hours while officers began their investigation. A report out today says parts of the rural northwest are being neglected. Natural England's calling for new measures to protect the region's countryside. It says while the Lake District benefits from national park status, natural habitats in other areas are being damaged by industry and agriculture. It suggests creating a national park around the country's coastline. And a survey's found that three quarters of drinkers don't know that a typical glass of wine contains three units of alcohol. The study for the Department of Health found more than a third didn't know what their recommended daily drinking limits were. The government's launching a new campaign to raise awareness. BBC Radio Manchester Sports with Joanne Smith. Alex Ferguson has accepted Manchester United should have a better record in the Champions League. Ferguson thinks they've slipped up at the final hurdle too often with the final in Moscow against Chelsea, just United's third appearance in a European Cup final. Well, with just two days to go until that final in Moscow, Chelsea goalkeeper Peter Cech has suggested that United may not be as hungry for success as Chelsea when they meet on Wednesday. Cech has told you, uh, tonight's Inside Sport programme the United's Premier League triumph may work in Chelsea's favour. Join Jimmy Wagg for Manchester Sports from 6 o'clock on Wednesday for all the build-up and action from the final in Moscow. 
Gretna has done administrators of acts the entire staff of the club, including the remaining players after the club's run out of money. Uh, there remains a glimmer of hope for Gretna, who have been relegated from the Scottish Premier League, with one potential buyer still looking at the club. And in the first test at Lords between England and New Zealand, it continues to head towards a draw on the final day. The Taurus are 110 for three. That's a lead of 70 runs. BBC Radio Manchester, satellite weather with Heather Stotts. Well, many places are going to get a dry afternoon. It'll become a little bit cloudy from time to time, but we're still going to see some sunny spells. There could be just a light shower or two developing this afternoon, but they are going to be few and far between. Top temperatures today, 14 Celsius. Lunchtimes belong to Beswick. Alan Beswick. BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Alan, I don't know if you're aware, but Stockport play Rochdale in a playoff game at Wembley next Monday. But having tried to get a coach from Stockport, the club say they have 50 coaches fully booked and can't get any more. So can you put a plea to any coach operators who have any spare to contact the club, will <laughs> you, um, fair enough. I don't know who that's come from. It's a text, but I don't know who it's from. But uh, there you are. Yeah, Stockport uh, apparently searching for coaches. No, 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 not that guy. No, the ones with the wheels. Yeah. 0161 228 Radio Manchester at bbc.co.uk. And, of course, you can text on 07786 206 951. And David says on the subject of alcohol, units and recommended numbers and all that gubbins, David's in sale, says... I try and stick to the weekly recommended maximum number of units every night. I can't see what the fuss is. Yes, very good. Yes, that, that's the reverse of that that joke, isn't it? I once spent, I won, I once spent. I, I that was it. I spent a month one weekend in Carlisle. It, it yeah, it lost a lot when I in the telling. It usually does. Alan in Crumpsall, are you? Well, good afternoon, Alan. All good right. afternoon, sir. Yeah, very well, thank you. It's. I, th I think we've got to clash, by the way. It's, it's all capital punishment. Well, uh, every now and again, you keep stating that you're, uh, what you call, again, as you call it, are you against it? So what about the appalling lawlessness which is happening now in England? So, well, uh, law and order has broken down. I should, it has more or less broken down. But this appalling murder rate we have here, and the other, the other, the other week it was on about open prisons, and these loonies down there, number 10 down, and see their policies, they're letting... Murderers just walk out of these open prisons, and I think three walked out and three murdered again. Strangulation and, and think, and I think the other one stabbed someone dead. And uh, honestly, if, if you have you ever been around these appalling crime scenes after a murder, and the appalling the families absolutely devastated forevermore. You know they never get over it, and bread and they're losing their houses and everything. And, and I'm a Christian, and I do agree with it. It's come out, it's, it's, it's just out of hand, isn't it? You can't well, as a, as a Christian, you have to believe in capital punishment, but because without it, you wouldn't have Christianity. Yeah, 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 I, I, I sort of realised that. But there's something that... I think I'm a good person. I've no record of nothing like like you are, basically. You're very hard work, and you're very... You're 100% honest. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with either of those, but go on. <laughs> I think um, so. Well, I don't work hard. I sit here for two hours a day. It's hardly working hard. And uh, honesty, the last thing you want in a broadcast, there is honesty, but never mind. Um, what, I, what I don't quite grasp is I, I, know, I know why you're against murder. You've told right, me. So uh, well, obviously. Me. You've told me why you're against murder, and that is the, of the pain it causes to the families and all the rest of it. What you haven't told me is why you're in favour of capital punishment. Well, it, it, it's the old chestnut again. You know, we go back now and we go back years. You'll say the 1940s, 20s, or before that. There's, there's absolutely no deterrent with anything here, is there? Any sort of crime. It's just broken down. And maybe in, in, in America... Well, Alan, Alan, when did you last steal something? Wait, n never, really. I'll never. Really, never? What stopped you? Just conscience, or just really. So it wasn't. It wasn't because you thought you might go to jail. Um, but well, that is, well, 
basically, if anyone shoplifts, they're crazy because... What no, 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 no. 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 This, you see, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to arrive at, what I'm trying to get you to explain to me the is... Terrence, what, yeah. ..why you think that people misbehave. Do you think it's because they aren't afraid of the consequence, or do you think it's because they have little regard for their fellow human? Little regard for a fellow human, Ellen, basically. So, in truth, the consequence is immaterial, really? Well, the reason why I don't steal is banishment from the shop. That's what everyone must remember. Isn't it? it, it never it's got, it's, not, it's, not, it's got nothing to do with the fact that you know it to be wrong. I also know it to be wrong. No, well, which is it? Are you simply saying, I don't steal because I'd be banned from the shop? Because, frankly, you'd get away with it a good few times before you were caught, and there are lots more shops in Crumpsall. I realise that, yeah. So it's not banning from the shop that stops you, is it? It's the fact that you think it's wrong. You were brought up and still believe it to be wrong, so you don't do it. As well, yeah. I'm like, Adolf Shipman wasn't mad. He knew, what he, right, he knew right from wrong. Take him. He, he probably did know right from wrong. But do you think capital punishment, which eventually he brought upon himself by hanging himself in his prison cell, do you think, do you think he would not have done it if there was capital punishment? Or do you still think, or do you think he would still have believed he wouldn't get caught? Well, a lot of people, Alan, when he was well, on the run, we, we, we was ended, we ended up being caught. We ended up with Harold Shipman. I yeah. didn't introduce him, you did. Harold Shipman... He could have been deterred. He no, could have been Har frightened. Do, do, do you really think that he sat there and thought, well, I'm thinking of murdering this woman, but... Oh, hang on a minute. If I get caught, I'll get hanged. No, I won't get hanged. In fact, in fact I'll only get 20 years. Oh, sod it. Let's kill her. Or do you think he thought, I'm going to kill this woman, and no one will ever know? Well, that's what he thought, Alan. Yeah. That's what he thought. So, so you introduced him. So that. you you introduced him. You introduced his him and his crimes in support of capital punishment, and yet you seem to accept that he believed he wouldn't get caught. So whatever, whatever the punishment wouldn't have mattered to him because he wasn't going to get caught. Well, the thing is, Earl, an eye for, it says in the Bible, an eye for an eye, they should pay for what they do anyway, you know, and even... Well, the it does indeed say that in the Bible. It says it in the Old Testament. Do you eat prawns, Alan? Pardon? Do you eat prawns? No, I, I, I do. Do you eat I'm bacon? Not, I'm, not, I'm not Jewish. Do you eat bacon? No, 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 you just quoted the Bible at me. I thought you agreed with the Bible. The Bible tells you not to eat bacon, Alan. Do you eat it? Uh, sometimes. So you disregard the Bible when it suits you? You disregard the Bible. Alan, Alan, you've tried Adol Shipman as a as a reason for capital punishment, and yet admitted that he'd have done it anyway. You've tried quoting the Bible at me, but when I quote b it back at you, you tell me it's wrong. So the Bible's right when it chops a baby in half, but it's wrong when it comes to eating prawns. Well, it never chops a baby in half. That, that yeah, it Moses, did. Wasn't it? Yeah. No, that was, well, where's Moses from? Is he from? Is he from Shakespeare or is he out the Bible? No, and it <laughs> wasn't. It wasn't Moses. It was Solomon. Solomon. And I, yeah. and I think I mean ma I may be misreading it. It may have been. I may have read it in Mary Poppins. But I think Solomon was in the Bible, the Old Testament, the same place, was, yeah. the same place as the eye for the eye and the tooth for the tooth. Might even have been the same bloke. Now I come to think of it, but never mind. So the Bible's fine when you think it wins your argument, and yet you disregard the rules that you don't think are appropriate. Well, but what about all this murder, what's going on? Is there no control with anything, is there? Well, eat less bacon, because I think if you give up bacon, murder will stop. 0161 228 2255. Old Testament, it's old because it's crap. Morning Sound Better with Eamon O'Neill and Diane Oxford. Eamon and Diane. Two BBC Radio Manchester reporters at the airport just as they leave for Moscow and a United fan who's decided to drive. <laughs> I have no grasp of, of where you would even start with that. Well, you need a car. I don't know, it's the shortest route. Hang on, I've got a map here for me. Eamon and Diane and you. We left London on Friday, got the Eurotunnel across to the France, drove through to Eindhoven on Friday night, then we drove to Berlin Saturday night and then yesterday we drove from Berlin to uh, Warsaw. The with Eamon and Diane for breakfast. It's quite an odd experience. Back tomorrow morning from 6 at BBC Radio Manchester. <laughs> He says, Alan, the reason criminals don't worry about the consequences is because of old bleeding heart liberals like you. 
That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Thank you very much indeed. 0161 228 Rex from Eaton Moor. Hi, Rex. Hello, Alan. Um, just a quick, you, you mentioned before about some guy that was looking, couldn't get a coach to uh, Wembley on Indeed, on, uh, for, from s- for Stockport, yeah. That's right. Well, well, we, we've got a minibus going, uh, and we're looking for six people to fill it, so is oh, any way Sorry? Oh, yes. I'm, uh, unfortunately, he didn't leave his name, but oh. if, if he's interested, then there you are. We, we yeah. are... Oh, well, uh, it's like the swap shop, isn't it? <laughs> we'll put you in touch with each other. Well, can you do that? I, uh, well, I can't. I don't know because, how you do it. Uh, no, I don't either, but we've got your telephone number. If the chap right. who texted me... Well, I don't know what the verb is to text, but if the chap who texted me, texts me again, uh, then I shall put him in touch with you. Oh, well, I won't, but I'm sure, I'm sure Richard or Andy will, but I won't. I'm not getting involved, unless there's a commission. Is there a commission? No, no commission, I'm sorry. Then I'll leave it to Richard yeah, and Andy. Oh, all right, thanks very much. <laughs> good on you. Thank <laughs> you right, very I'm much a... indeed. There, you see, you ask and you shall receive, as the good book says. Oh, no, that's the new one. 0161 228 2255. If you want to join us today, you can. You see, it's wonderful, isn't it, how we do that? I like that. Yeah, I have a problem. I have a solution. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. The two thousand and seven poppy appeal raised a record sum of just under thirty million quid. The Royal British Legion announced yesterday it was so much it's took until now to count it. The figure represents an increase of more than 15%, so it's more than an inflation increase, so well done, everybody, on the 2006 figure of 26 million. The Legion's Director of National Events and Fundraising said the welfare work of the Royal British Legion is close to the nation's hearts and minds, and so is the support for our armed forces. Well, that's an interesting parallel, isn't it? I know lots of people who buy poppies who do not support the armed forces. I know, I actually know pacifists who buy poppies. And they buy poppies not to support the armed forces, but to support the consequences on human beings of the armed forces. I don't suppose the Royal British Legion cares as long as it gets the money in. That's what they're about, and good on them for that. They do tremendous work. They really do. I've said before, I'll say again, it's a terrible shame that they have to do that tremendous work. It is a terrible, terrible shame. And it's shame on the government that it does that. It's shame on the government that the Royal British Legion needs to exist. The Royal British Legion ought not to exist. We ought not to need it. This nation of ours ought to say to the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, or the the air service personnel, because some of them are women now, rather bizarrely. Anyway, it ought to say to them, look, you've been injured at our behest, and we're going to keep you comfortable for the rest of your life not we're going to give you enough to eat and maybe the occasional crutch but we're actually going to keep you comfortable for the rest of your life that should be what the government does when Blair and his cronies send people to war they know that some will be dead and frankly that's the fun of the game they know some will be dead however however some will be seriously injured and they should be looked after. Not quite in Clover, but not far from it. Jackie in Liverpool. Okay. Hi. Hiya, Jackie. Hi. What have we got? I'll uh, just turn on your radio programme literally a few moments ago. Thank you. I heard you talking to somebody about the Bible and bacon and various things, and then I heard you say the reason the Old Testament is old is because it's crap. And I could not believe that you said that. I oh, really yeah. take obsection take exception to that you know and no. i don't i think if you do you, i just can't believe you say that would you say that about another holy book yeah you would good god yes okay there's, so you don't you don't care no about offending a, anybody no there's no such thing as a holy book it's well, just there a isn't book. in your there isn't in your opinion well it was me that was talking i can't yes, express but, somebody else's opinion no but i think that's a very disrespectful thing to say and well, i don't, I don't think it's a I very responsible respect. thing to say i don't owe respect so having a position on the media where you're broadcasting to thousands of people doesn't mean you should have any respect for them or any consideration I for them? I have respect for the human beings, but not the novels they read. 
Well, in your opinion, it's a novel, and a That's lot of people's I've got. opinion. I've only got my opinion. And a lot of people's opinion that is a, a scripture, and they believe that it is God's word. Well, they're well, daft. In your opinion, they're daft. Well, I'm, I'm giving my, my opinion. opinion. Yeah, and I'm giving my opinion. I well, think give it's it outrageous. Then. Well, fine. Well, I think Be it's outraged. outrageous that you can say something is crap. Well, do you, why do you not? not? Do you think it's okay to broadcast absolutely anything then? Not absolutely anything. No. Where, where would you draw the line? I've not found it yet. Right. But I don't believe in absolutes, which is why I think the Bible's crap. Well, have, would you be prepared to say that about another religious book, then? What, you mean the Koran? Anyone. Crap. You'd be prepared to say that. I just said it, you deaf. Right, OK. I think they're all crap. I don't believe in religion, in no, terms well, of the godly obviously bit of it. Obviously, you don't. Yeah. I'm, I don't believe in religion. I have a faith. Mm, that's bizarre, but go on. Explain, if well, you want. Don't put I have a faith. Out, you know. No, yeah. I have I have a faith in God, and I believe his. What I believe the Bible is His word. Do you? Yes, I do. How did he write it? He wrote it. Is it, I believe it's inspired word of God that's yeah. been written through many people, and there's there's mm. many prophecies in the Old Testament that have been fulfilled. There's also and, some that are balmy. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, okay, you want. So as long as we understand no, that, we, no, God, God didn't get it I all right. Say, no, I don't agree that there's some that are balmy. There might be some that are very difficult to understand. All right. But if, you know, if God's God and He's so not eating, he's not amazing eating, enough to be not able to eating the, the world. Not eating the pig. Not eating the pig isn't balmy. That's fine. God said that, so that's okay. We shouldn't do it. Do you do it? I'm not. I'm or not is that talking one of the about. Ones? No, I'm not talking. I'm not getting into a detail of something. If you want to do that with someone, that's a different thing. What I'm. I'm not bothered point, either way, love. I've got my, to sit here till my, two. My point is that I don't think you should say. Well, that you've made your point. Is that? Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? No, there isn't anything okay. else. Okay. Ta-da now. Bye. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. She thinks I shouldn't say it, and yet by coming on, she made me say it again. BBC Radio Manchester. Headline News. MPs will this afternoon vote on whether to allow scientists to continue research on hybrid embryos, which are a mixture of human and animal tissue. The Manchester Evening News Arena has announced it's to screen the Champions League final in Moscow live on Wednesday night. And a report out today says parts of the natural, rural, I should say, northwest are being neglected. Natural England is calling for new measures to protect the region's countryside. Manchester's weather, dry, some sunny spots. Bells, highs of 15 Celsius. I'm Mark Edwardson. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. Still have no service on the Metro Link, I'm afraid. Now, this is all because of a power failure in the Timperley area. The whole of the line is still suspended for the moment. Now, I do have some further information for you. Passengers using the Metro Link, if you're using the Altrium line, you need to use the 263 Arriva bus service. The Berry line, it's the 135 or the 98 first bus service. And the Eccles line, the 33 instead. So uh, do uh, be aware of those problems at the moment, causing a lot of disruption across the whole network. Now to Virgin Trains, the delays are being reported of 50 minutes between Crewe and Nuneaton due to overhead line problems at Litchfield Trent Valley. Hopefully, though, normal service should be resumed by around about 3 o'clock this afternoon. In Rochdale, no change on Berry Road. It's still closed off because of a collision between Mellor Street and Sandy Lane. That happened in the rush this morning, and the diversion for the moment takes you off via Roach Valley Way, Manchester Road and Dane Street. And if you can update me on anything you've heard or spotted on your journey this afternoon, do call in hands-free. The number Numbers 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. Helping Manchester. Help Manchester. BBC Radio Manchester Interaction with Linda Kay. If you think you're pretty good behind the wheel, this could be your perfect hobby. The Institute of Advanced Motorists put thousands of people through their advanced driving tests. And if you love driving, you could be one of their coaches. You do this by passing an advanced driving test, then you can become an observer, which basically means that you're going to lift your driving skills to a higher level, but learn how to coach others. Perry Freeman. It's quite easy. There is a national observer training programme. It's done by sitting alongside a driver in the car 
car and observing their driving, point out their errors, correct the errors and lift their driving standards. It's £85 to take the test and all the money goes back to the charity to help improve road safety. Well, that's not the only reason to do it. I do it for the kick. The ability to actually take somebody out who hasn't got that experience and then show them a different way of driving that's more exciting, they'll get much, much more out of their drive than they'd ever thought possible. If you want to know more about advanced driving or being an observer, call Interaction for a free information pack. 0161 244 4321. If you're really passionate about your driving, it's a lot of fun. BBC Radio Manchester Interaction with CSB Broadcast. 0161 244 4321. BBC Radio Manchester. A very good day to you. Are you alright? Good. 0161 228 2 double five feel free we had uh, an ex copper he, c- he comes on from time to time he's a good lad john earlier and he was saying that policemen uh, police marksmen should shoot to wound or alternatively they should fire a gas canister and thus incapacitate the individual not everybody agrees with him terry's rather effusive in his condemnation of the remark a question shoot to kill or shoot to wound was this question in relation to your caller, John? If so, then shoot to kill. That is very, very cruel indeed, but I think I know the point you're making. My God, he was an ex-policeman, says Terry. He still is an ex-policeman and is entitled to his point of view. And uh, the man's an idiot. Wounded animals are at their most dangerous when cornered. This man doesn't know what he's talking about. Shoot to kill if people's lives are at risk. So says Ace. What do you say? Well... You can tell me on 0161 228 Arthur in Sale. Hiya. Well, hello, Alan. I've just got to take a, a, an opinion, a, a, um, a view, sorry, on what you're speaking to that one about religion. OK. Um, yeah, you're absolutely spot on, Alan. Uh, religion is crap. The Bible's crap. The Quran's crap. It's all crap. And I think these religious lunatics are, 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 are as crazy as people who's but not, not quite as dangerous, but as brainwashed as people who fly planes into buildings. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> I've gone too far on, haven't no, I? No, you haven't gone too far at all. You're free, you're free to say virtually what you like with me. But religion's crap. I'm not sure I agree. There are people who practice religion who are an abomination, just like there are, I don't know, rugby fans who are an abomination. But in the end, religion if you take it at its simplest, is a belief system. We we had Alan on earlier, the guy who was talking against capital punishment. Now, Alan has a belief system. That belief system was taught to him using the Bible as its its authoritative book, if you like. Now, you and I think that book has no authority at all. It's just a novel. But that that doesn't mean those people who surround it with an aura of belief are wrong in everything else they do. Alan no, is a I, decent I, citizen because of his beliefs. Yeah, I, I, I took it a little bit too far. I, what I'm saying is that I, I don't, I'm not religious. I don't, there never was a god. There never will be a god. It's just somebody who's trying to justify a lot of the time these people. Well, well why are we here? Who, who, who made that tree and all that rubbish? You know, why they just can't get on with their own lives and just lead a life and, and be, you know, j- just live by what we perceived to be good. I know you can go off in different directions with that comment, you know, what what people perceive to be good and wrong, but we all generally have an idea what that means. But I I, I just feel the Bible, it's been written how many times, how many, I mean, if if you think of Chinese whispers, if you tell a tale two years ago and you tell the same tale now, it's just changed beyond comprehension. And it's just, for me, it's the same with the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying on that one? Well, yes, it calls, I mean, (laughs) it it is very, very easy to denounce the Bible as not being a document of truth. It's very easy. But that doesn't mean it's a document of harm. No, no, no. People could use it that way. Yeah, they do. do, I mean, the the best use I've ever seen for a Bible was the army doctor who hit my wrist with it to cure (laughs) me ganglion, and it worked. I've never had a ganglion since. But, But... the teaching that can be derived from the Bible is well worth having, isn't it? Thou shalt sure. not kill and all that. Oh right, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure it is. I, I mean, you know, I, obviously, I, I agree with that sentiment. Thou shalt not kill, whatever. But I don't need the Bible to tell me that. I just need basic common sense to tell me that. 
because uh, I don't, you know, you, you end up in, uh, uh, you know, you end up losing your liberty, and uh, not that you want to kill anyone, anyone anyway. But I'll also come on to say is that I, I just have your sentiments, maybe probably deeper than yours, go further than yours. I just can't stand the Bible and all the crappy drivel is be religious farts talk about. The, the, the test, the test I always use. There's no, there's no French in religious. The test I, <laughs> I always use is if I had the power, would I ban it? Now there's a question for you. If you had a power, would you ban the private practice of religion? Personally, yeah, yeah. Would you? Just, more, just more harm than good. Well, I, mean, I disagree. If, you see, if, if, if people could just live, you know, live, live their lives without, without. No. I'd like the woman who come on offended because you call the Bible crap. Well, I mean, she should wake up and smell the coffee because it is, it is crap. It's one hundred percent. You, crap. you not, would ban not, it. Not, not that I've read it, like you know. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bit harsh, really. A condemnation it of is, something you've not is, read. Yeah. Absolutely. All yeah. right. Good on you. Thanks, Alan. Cheers. As I say, one of my tests for a thing is if I had the power, would I ban it? And I wouldn't ban the Bible or the Quran or any other holy book. I wouldn't ban them. But then I wouldn't ban Mein Kampf or any of those other things. I just wouldn't. I think people are entitled to express their view in whatever they wish, and they're, express, they're entitled to believe whatever they believe, however daft I think it is. Will in crew, are you? Hi, Alan. What can we do for you, sir? I would like to defend your uh, um, uh, right to um, not believe in, in the Bible and, and religion and so on, and have a comment and opinion about the Bible, uh, as we should all be allowed to do. It's a free country so far. Now, the thing that confuses me with the Bible, and I have read it, a lot of it, and forgotten most of it, but um, the new uh, born-again Christians say that you have to accept Jesus before you can go to heaven. And that's confused me, because before Jesus came onto the scene 2,000 years ago, did no one go to heaven? Um, presumably not. Presumably they were held in the limbo well, that the Pope's just cancelled. Well, that's what's confused me. I wonder where they all are. <laughs> you know. I don't know. All those, all those early popes and and, oh, yeah. and the like. Well, they weren't popes, were they? But those early religious... Like like Abraham, Solomon, where did they go? Well, that's it. They probably uh, mm. walk around somewhere looking for a Bible to read, that's what we imagine. Ah, presumably, yes. Presumably. I, it's very difficult. I, 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 whenever you start to examine any document, really, of... Mm. of what you might call public document rather than a legal document. Whenever you start examining any public document, it's very, very easy to poke the finger and say it's balmy. Very easy. And, and not necessarily an inaccurate statement for that. But it's, it's to misunderstand the function of religion to think. I mean, that, that lady came on because I was, in her view, attacking her... I mean, she described it as her faith, which she's entitled to, but more accurately, attacking her belief system, her reason for being, her her belief on how the world came to being. And, and she's right to be cross. But I, I agree with you that it's part of my job to make her cross. I think if you would have said, uh, hadn't said it the way you said it, if you have said, well, it's something I can't subscribe to, and neither can many, many others. I mean, the Bible is only one religion, of course. There are many religions who all believe in this one God. Well, for a start, the Bible's two religions, isn't it, in a way? Because uh, the, old, the Old Testament is Judaism and yeah. the New Testament's Christianity. So that's two just from the one book. That's very confusing. But um, listening to all the programmes there, I've found myself um, agreeing with you in lots of things. It's like this punishment that was, the guy was talking about before when people do commit heinous crimes and uh, the law and order system seems to be breaking down quite a bit. Well, bring back old-fashioned bread and water, in my opinion... Uh, and then they can all sit there freezing the tripes off, having bread and water, and the money you want for your soldiers... Yeah. Can we tell, tell give, them, give them that, yeah, and we could get that big wheel where they all had to walk on it as well. Good on you, Will. Have a yeah, good day, I'm, mate. I'm, Cheers. I'm, I'm, 0161 228 an anonymous text. I live my life according to the Lord of the Rings, the best story ever told, and a damn sight closer to the truth, says anonymous. You yellow-bellied swine. Uh, Sam, in Newtonley Willers, hi. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir what can Alan. we do for you? Uh, very simply, that gentleman who described all the holy books uh, as that offensive word, uh, I, I think he went a little bit too too much, too far, and he admitted that. 
he never he did not study these books and to describe them uh, in, and use this word is absolute not acceptable i believe in my holy book and in my in my holy book i believe in the in the two other religions which are christianity and judaism and i believe that religion is here to make our life a little bit better cleaner tidier without going into too much details this is what i believe in you don't believe fine i mean this is personal choice let's say okay but to describe if you don't believe that we have to hang you kill you whatever this is this is too much so uh, i i think he realized towards the end of his discussion or conversation with yourself that he he went a little bit too far this is my point i just want to put okay well you've put it i mean okay. my my difficulty with it all is that they are in the end just books uh, this is this is your view. My, my well, they my are just view. books. I mean, there's well, no there's no escaping. That's nobody's view. That's a reality. They are books. Okay, it's on, book. That's it. It's a book. It's a, a series it's a of manual. pieces of paper bound together with words on each of the pages. It's the manual. When you buy a new car, you have a manual with it. When you buy a you video, do you have a manual and with it. And what we so. discover with the video and the car manual is they're not really believable. They are in most cases of value. But sometimes they're a waste of space. Uh, so we'll I leave accept, this to debate I accept for your some analogy. Other, uh, discussion. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll leave Thanks. it till then. As I'm good to talk to you. Oh one six one two two eight double two double five. If you've something you wish to share with Manchester, then feel free. Just to let you know, since we're lining up to be offended, I will be offended if you stop offending the religious nutters like that woman. Listening to them squirm makes for wonderful radio entertainment. Peter in Oldham. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways, apparently. Bill in Wigan. Hi, uh, Hello, Alan. What can we do for you? Well, about this uh, religious business we've been on about, um, I do not know an atheist that, that I know of. I might know an atheist and not be aware of it. I don't know. But you're a self-professed atheist, aren't you? It depends on your definition, but go on. Um, no, I was wondering if... I won't say atheists. I'll say you as a person, as an individual. Do you have any theories, if you could call it that, of how human beings came to populate the Earth or how the Earth came to be a tiny, tiny planet among millions of others? Uh, questions like that. Do you have any idea where human beings originated or came from? Any theories at all on that? Not topic? really, no. No. No, that's fair enough. That's a quick answer. So you, you don't have any theories whatsoever? No. I, I've read the ones, um, not in extreme detail, because I'm not clever enough, but I've read the ones about the Big Bang and all of that. And mm. that, that sounds uh, believable, but frankly... I can't see a reason for knowing it. I'm, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of this study of where we, you know, where the, where the Big Bang happened. I, I can't, mm. I can't work that out. I don't, I don't criticise those who spend their days doing it because mm. doing what I do for a living, I can hardly criticise people who do something pointless. Um, but, but I, I, I don't really give much credence to either. I don't think what happened, twenty fifty billion years ago is is of much consequence to me really well, well, i don't care i i i'm uh, sort of on the fence on this but uh i think we sit people... side by side bill <laughs> 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 apparently go on uh, uh, I, I respect people who uh who have uh, their own theories and beliefs they're entitled to them of course um but someone like yourself who has no beliefs in anything whatsoever I find it hard to come to terms with. Well, I can, I can, ease, I can ease your difficulty by saying I, mm. I don't claim to have no belief whatsoever. I have no firm belief on how mankind came to populate the Earth, the already existent Earth. I'm prepared to accept the idea of Darwin that we sort of descended, in simplistic terms, we descended from apes, but... Uh, I'm not, who I'm not, put the apes there? Well, exactly. So, like I say, I'm prepared to accept the, the Darwinian evolution theory for how we, this species, came to occupy the Earth. But Darwin didn't have anything to say about how the Earth came to being. 
and I've not yet read anything that I'm clever enough to understand and say, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Well, to go further back than that, I've read somewhere or other uh, that we originated from swamps. And then you come to well, the... Well, yeah, I've read that as well, yeah. And, 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 and then I can you go with that. And then you come to the full stop. Who put these living creatures or well, whatever see, into the swamps? I, I think it was Heather that was Heather Stott one morning last week was doing what is, what is your earliest memory? And my earliest memory, and people don't believe me when I tell them this, but my earliest memory is walking across the field at the back of our house. I don't know what age I was. I think that's for you, not me. It is I don't know what age I was, but I must have been two or three or maybe, a, I don't know, but very, very young. And I walked there and I, I'd just come back from church one Sunday lunchtime. And I walked there thinking, well, if God made everything, who made God? And it's exactly the question that you, or the, the, the dilemma that you've just posited and that is that everything has to have a beginning and i've yet i've yet to find the beginning i i don't know when the earth began i don't know when the the great what we might call the the, the great uh, panoply of stars and planets began i've no idea and i don't lose much sleep but if eventually if eventually someone convinced me that they all came because god made them I would say, who made God? Well, I, I was brought up as a Roman Catholic. I, I, I'm not a staunch Roman Catholic, no. Uh, being born in the 1920s, we were uh, brought up rather strict in this religious business. But however, um, we were taught that time had no beginning and will have no end. No, a human mind can't get round that. You know, That's it's like correct. finding the starting point of a circle. Indeed it is. Uh, we, we cannot. It's beyond our comprehension, I believe. I, I, mm. I, I know. Something without beginning and something that will never end is, is totally beyond us. Mm. So rather than argue about it uh, and try to understand it, I just went along with it and said, well, that, that's it. That's what we're taught. But then, of course, when you grow up, you start to ask questions. And how do the people who advocate that sort of thing, how did they, how did they get it? But, the, but the, problem, the problem is, Bill, that if you eventually say, well, OK, um, something must have happened to create the Earth. The reason one says that, whether you be scientist or believer, the reason one says that is exactly as you just described. We don't have the, the intellect to work out that there wasn't a beginning and there, wasn't, there won't be an end. No, we Time haven't. is perpetual. It's and so this. then you have to say, well, something had to start it. And if the answer is the Big Bang, as one or two scientists believe, if the answer is the Big Bang, what was it that went bang? There must have been something there before. Well, or, exactly, yes. Or if you're a believer and you say, well, it's easy, God made it in six days, on the seventh day he rested, you simply say, well, that's fine, but who made him? Somebody must have done and that's the dilemma and frankly I've not got room in my brain for it I'm, I'm too busy worrying what, what I'm going to have for tea well I don't think any human being on Indeed. this earth can... we must agree on that Bill we must have it yes. cheers but, mate uh... we don't understand we've agreed on that we'll settle for it because we've got to go to this now headline news Manchester's Metrolink tram system has been shut down after a control room power failure. It's hoped the problem will be solved early this afternoon. Burma has announced three days of national mourning for victims of Cyclone Nargis. And MPs are preparing to debate a controversial bill which could allow scientists to create hybrid embryos for medical research. Manchester's weather, mainly dry, some sunshine and a high of 15 Celsius. I'm Mark Edwards. He doesn't fool me. They've all gone up partying on the 200 million they've got. They don't fool me. BBC Radio Manchester. 2020 traffic. And as we just heard there in the news, Metrolink have suspended all services because of a power failure in the Timpley area. Passengers may use the following buses for the the Altrincham line, you need to use the 263 Arriva bus service. The Berry line, it's the 135 and the 98 first bus service. And for the Eccles line, it's the 33 bus service. And of course, we will keep you updated throughout the afternoon. Now to Virgin Trains, and delays are still being reported of 50 minutes on Virgin Trains between Crewe and Nuneaton due to some 
overhead line problems at Litchfield Trent Valley. Hopefully, though, normal service should be resumed by around about 3 o'clock. Do make sure you check with National Rail Inquiries before you travel. In Rochdale, better news now. Berry Road has been reopened. There was an accident earlier this morning in the morning peak between Mellor Street and Sandy Lane. The diversion has all been cancelled now. And again, traffic's moving at a much better pace around the area. Uh, no build-ups on the motorways. M60 fairly quiet, as to is the M62 across the Pennines from Manchester towards Leeds and uh, on the westbound carriageway moving fairly well too. Don't forget, if you can update me though, do get in touch and the number to dial, as always, is 0161 244 4951. I'm Cara Banks. BBC Radio Manchester. Sports. Good afternoon, I'm Joanne Smith. Rochdale have lodged an appeal with the FA over David Perkins sending off in their playoff semi-final victory over Darlington. If it's upheld, he would miss the playoff final against Stockport on Monday. Perkins scored the goal, which drew Dale level and took the tie into extra time and penalties. Well, Dale's Tom Kennedy says the team's togetherness has been the key to their success in getting to the playoff final. Dale will face Stockport at Wembley next Monday for a place in League One, with Kennedy admitting the support of assistant manager Dave Flitcroft, whose father has recently passed away, has been important. I've never seen a spirit like it in a team. We play for each other, we play for the fans, we play for Flickers, we play for Gaffer, you know, we play for all the staff. Everybody just, you know, chips in and it's, it's brilliant and, and that's what togetherness is and that's what a club is all about. Do you know what I mean? It's nothing I've ever witnessed before and it's absolutely brilliant. Well, the Stockport chairman says the club deserves praise for this season, whether they achieve promotion or not to League One. This is Norman Beverley. This season was a success once we stayed in the division again. I mean, you know, that's the first thing. We achieved that, we then made it into the playoffs. Oh, what happens, happens. What, you know, we'll see, what we'll get there and what happens, happens. It's just fantastic for everybody. We need to enjoy the moment and see what, where we get to. Well, as his team travels to Moscow for the Champions League final, Manchester United manager Alex Ferguson has accepted they should have a better record in the competition. The meeting with Chelsea is just United's third appearance in a European Cup final. Ferguson thinks they've slipped up at the final hurdle too often. We've had a lot of close calls over the years and semi-final against Dortmund. I felt we should have won semi-final with Leverkusen. We should have won. And the disappointment of... Milan been better than his last season. You don't forget these things because, as I've said many times, and it's you not know, escaped me this very moment, is that we should have a better record in Europe. Well, with just two days to go until that Champions League final, the man games are certainly in full swing. The Chelsea goalkeeper Peter Cech has suggested that United may not be as hungry for success as Chelsea when they meet in Wednesday's Champions League final in Moscow. Check us told tonight's Inside Sport programme that United's Premier League triumph may work in Chelsea's favour. Well, having won the title, you, you would say is a big boost for them. You know, because mentally they know they, they won the title, they finished above us and they celebrated, which in, in one way can be destructive. You know, when you, when you know you already won something, even if you don't want, you can relax. In the, in the back of your mind, you have already that you succeeded and, and the season, you know, we succeeded and, and maybe they will be more relaxed and, and this could be the advantage for us. Well, UEFA have confirmed that Slovakian referee Lubos Mikel will take charge of the Champions League final. He was the referee who awarded a highly controversial goal to Liverpool against Chelsea in the semi-finals of the competition in 2005. Join Jimmy Wag for Manchester Sports from 6 o'clock for all the build-up and action from the final in Moscow on Wednesday. Now, the chances of Real Madrid signing the Manchester United winger Cristiano Ronaldo have been played down by the club's coach, Bernard Schuster. Despite the Real general manager saying they had the financial clout to buy him, Schuster doesn't think it's possible to sign Ronaldo this summer. Gretna's administrators have axed the entire staff of the club, including the remaining players. The staff were summoned to a meeting this morning where it was confirmed the club's money has run out. The first test at Lords between England and New Zealand continues to look like it's heading for a draw on the final day. New Zealand's cricketers at lunch are 113 for three. Um, that's a second innings lead of 71 runs. Jamie Howe is unbeaten on 66. Ricky Hatton insists he will bounce back, a stronger fighter from his first career defeat to Floyd Mayweather. The hitman faces Juan Lascano in front of 55,000 fans at the City of Manchester Stadium on Saturday. If he beats the Mexican, he could face Paulo Magnaghi in America before a possible rematch with Mayweather. 
I want to fight Malinaji in unification matches at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, I don't want to, um, you know, fight uh, Floyd Mayweather again. I've got to redeem myself first. All I can do is redeem myself with a fantastic performance against Juan Lascano and say, well, you know, I lost my undefeated record, but I didn't lose that 10 stone. That's what a lot of people are forgetting. I haven't lost that 10 stone since I was 17 years of age. So uh, you know, I want to put in a performance that says, look, still the man to beat in junior welterweight division. Danny Cipriani will be out of action for around six months. Wasp have confirmed he suffered a fractured dislocation of his right ankle in a Premiership playoff semi-final win over Bath. It means the England fly half may also miss the autumn internationals. And in tonight's the league match, Bellevue faced Poole at Kirkmansheen Lane. To watch your favourite programmes on the BBC HD channel, you'll need an HD-ready TV and an HD service with a digital box. You can get an HD service by monthly subscription to Sky, Virgin Media, or now for a one-off payment and no subscription from Freesat. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk slash bbchd. TV Go Cinematic He's a on yank. the BBC HD channel. He's a bloody yank. What are we doing using yanks to advertise the BBC? For God's sake. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not just saying... I could have done it. Yeah, they don't want me doing it. They want somebody who talks a bit posh, for crying out loud. But he's a bloody yank. For crying out loud. Oh, it's not just me, is it? Is it? Oh, well, never mind. Jeff in sales says, As a former squaddy, I totally agree with your comments on the British Legion. Charity for injured surface p service personnel. Bloody obscene. Well stated. Uh, and I hope you agree with me, Jeff, that we're not having a go at the, the British Legion. They've had to step in because of the tight wads that run this country. Just before I go to Sean in Didsbury, we had Michael on earlier making allegations of jiggery-pokery at a, a count in a parish council, like anyone gives a damn about them, but a parish council in the Warrington area. We got on to Warrington Council. This is their statement. They have the right of reply and they've taken it, which is good of them. Thank you. We've received, this is Warrington Council speaking, we've received communications from Mr Foxhall relating to the Parish Council elections of 1st May 2008. The issues raised in these communications have been carefully considered and we've provided him with detailed responses based on legal advice. It's now for Mr Foxhall to consider his position. We therefore come on, cannot comment further at this stage other than to make it clear that we remain confident that the election was conducted in a way which was substantially in accordance with the law as to elections. So that's their view of it. Thank you very much to them and indeed to Michael as well. Sean in Didsbury. Hiya. 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 I'd like to make a few points uh, with regard to the calls you just had. You're speaking to Bill and he said that time had no beginning. Time did have a beginning because... Before the Big Bang, there was no time and no space. So time, time did have a beginning 13 billion years ago, and there's no space. Space and time are, are, are interlinked. With regard to the um, before Christ coming, uh, did people go to heaven? Well, after the fall of Adam and Eve, heaven was closed. and there was no, no one could go to heaven, and there was what's known as the limbo of the patriarchs, which is... is uh, you know, rock solid doctrine that the say Abraham, the bosom of Abraham, before before Christ uh, Christ's resurrection, there, there, there was um, nobody, the just could not enter heaven. And as for the other limbo, uh, which um, has never actually been formally defined by the church, it's just been uh, theological speculation. For example, where do the souls of aborted babies go? You know, you know anyone innocent who dies and they're not baptized, do they go? Do they go to heaven straight away, or, or are they kept somewhere else? It, it's it's not. It was never. It was never actually a formal uh, doctrine uh, limbo. So the Pope didn't abolish it. It it never. It never uh, was. It was just theological speculation. And and as isn't and as, that what it all is? No, no. Because you see, you're coming from the standpoint of being a relativist. And um, so if you're I, a relativist... I've, I've, I don't know what that is. Well, that means fine. that you have no absolute values. If you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the absolute. So that means everything is negotiable, you see? So you're either an absolutist, that you believe that there are certain um, fundamentals that uh, something, certain thing is always wrong. For example, thou shalt not murder. There's no... That's always wrong Excuse me a moment. The commandment doesn't say thou shalt not murder. 
It does. The actual, the actual it Hebrew... It, it doesn't. In English, it's translated, thou shalt not kill. Uh, excuse me. Murder is a crime of death against the law of the land. But that, so that is, the a, legal, I, that is I, a legal I, definition of murder. Um, uh, I, I define mm -hmm. murder as the taking of innocent life. Okay? And, and who uh, is English, the judge? Well, uh, you, you, you look at um, the dictionary, the there are various entries in the dictionary. And, uh, and the dictionary is comparatively new compared oh. to the Ten Commandments. Well, well do you I agree have with me, it's always wrong to take innocent life? Um, is that an absolute for you? I can't have an absolute unless ah. you will give me an absolute definition well, of innocence. Well, so, someone who has done no harm, his life, her life is sacred. There is no definition of innocence. Well, someone who has, who has not committed committed a wrong is innocent well when you say wrong to take an innocent life yeah. that would make all warfare sinful as opposed to just no, wrong. No, there is, a, there is a, wa all warfare is not intrinsically sinful. There of is course it is. War. The inevitable. No, no there no, isn't. The, excuse the, me. War, the inevitable consequence of of war is the loss of innocent lives. But to deliberately, to deliberately seek. You to deliberately take wage life. war. If you deliberately wage war, you deliberately decide that you will kill innocent people. Therefore, no, you by your the, definition, not mine, it is no, sinful. If you have the, in it's the intentionality. If the intentionality. The intention I'm sorry. Are you really suggesting? Are you really suggesting that somebody could wage war, and not in making that? When when Blair said we will invade Iraq. Did he honestly believe, could he reasonably honestly believed, that not one innocent person would die? Oh, I, I don't go along with the war in Iraq anyway. I'm not bothered about the but, war but, in Iraq. Let's no, go with the war uh, against Hitler, then. Let's go with any of okay, the wars okay, you okay. want. It's, it is impossible let me, to let, wage war. Let me war. clarify this, Alan. Let me clarify this. Feel free. It is wrong, it's your book. It is wrong to deliberately target innocent life. So, for example... But you bombing. inevitably deliberately target innocent life. No, because... Yes. If, if you... Yes. If, 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 if for example, a non How are we defining target, guilty? Sorry? How are we defining guilty? Well, with guilty, if you're culpable, if, if you... Of, of culpable some, some of crime, what? Of some... Of some of and who some defines wrong. the crime? The well, killer? No, it is, it is an absolute... It is an absolute... For an absolute, Sean, for the definition of an absolute, you're having terrible trouble with the complexity Well, do you believe it. in truth, Alan? Do you no. believe... No. Well, you see, you're a relativist, then. No, I'm, I'm quite happy to be defined and as who, one. It's who, just new who, to me. Who stood before Punch... Who stood before Christ and asked the question, what Nobody. is truth? Pontius Pilate. Nobody. He was a relativist. Nobody. He said, what is truth? Nobody. You... I... You I believe as much in Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy as I do in Pontius Pilate. Well, that's just being... I mean... It is indeed being facetious, but it's in yes, order to maintain a decorum we're of talking, accuracy. We're talking about earnest matters here, and truth is... Well, yeah, is, 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 is there is no of, such thing as truth. Well, that's what, that's what Pilate asked Jesus. It is... So, he well, says, what is truth? I'm not really bothered... You, you are a relative uh, then. Sean, if you wish to use novels to support your point of view, then feel free, but don't expect me to fall well, into you, it. Well, you can be provocative saying that, and that... that but, it's but, not provocative, Sean. Well... There is no such you, thing... Well, you are. You are being provocative. There is uh, no Alan. such thing as truth. There is such thing means, as belief. Well, then, then you are a relativist. Well, I'm... You uh, don't have... That means Sean, you... Sean, you, 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 you say it as if it's offensive. You have no foundation. Look, well, I think... I think there are two types of stances, and there's only two. There are only two. Either By you your believe definition, in truth, or you believe in relativism, and you, you. I'm happy with that. That means that means you 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 change you 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 can change your uh, your stances. I, where, where I, can, I say there are eternal sure, values. I can so indeed cool. change my stances. My teachers used to call it learning. So is it always so? So I say to you, it is always wrong to deliberately seek to take innocent life. And I, and, I, and I say to you, I don't accept your definition. Well, for example, for example, if, uh, e.g., if, if, if there is um, an, an innocent baby, you could never kill that baby uh, for your own ends. I accept that unless, of course, the baby dies as a consequence of an action that I knew would be the outcome. But if you targeted that baby... Uh, you just that changed it, Sean. No, no. If your action, yes, yes. if your action, Alan, was to deliberately take if that I, life, if I decide to fire a mortar shell into 
an hereditament, I know that therein will be people who I am not meaning to kill. Am I a murderer? Your definition, not mine. Am yeah, I a if, murderer? If you, if you am I a murderer it, in that? I you, target the if building... You know, if you know that there are innocent people there and you target that building... What do you define as knowledge? Well, what, 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 you, what you have at your disposition. Uh, so if I blinker myself, don't bother to look, don't bother to ask, don't bother to consider, don't even wonder, but just fire the mortar, that's not murder. That's cause... been reckless, and that is, that is, that is wrong. Yes. OK. So if I know there is a reasonable chance there will be, but the person in there has got a machine gun and will kill 50 people, so I think, well, it's a small price to take some innocent life to stop him taking an innocent life. Is that OK, Why you, you could try targeting the I'm asking you, is with it a machine gun, but you should, you should do... Sean, I'm glad I live on my planet. Have a good day. 0161 228 to book a call for tomorrow. I'm off. See you tomorrow. She's next. Cancel the newspaper subscription. Everything you need to know. Manchester Now, tonight at...